Hi, so my name is Dr. Derva Collins. I'm one of the consultant medical oncologists in Cork University Hospital, and I have a particular interest in gynecological cancers um, with specialty in ovarian cancer uh, among um, uh, the other gyne cancers. Um, so I'm really grateful that I was uh, invited to give this Zoom talk. This is the first time I am exploring this side of uh, technology. Um, and um, I hope you in enjoy the following talk. So I want to just give an overview on ovarian cancer in Ireland. So it's, it's the sixth most common uh, invasive cancer. Uh, the lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer for, for obviously females is about one in 80 uh, within their lives. And it is generally a cancer of older people with only about 20% within um, uh, the group that's less than 50 years of age. And sort of steady increase um, of another 20% from 50 to 60, another 25% from 60 to 70, um, um, and from then uh, into old age. Um, so in general, it presents, uh, unfortunately, quite late. And this has been a real um, challenge with ovarian cancer, is that the majority of cancers come at stage three or stage four, which is a quite advanced cancer. Cancer has moved outside of where it began um, and spread into organs, often around the lining of the tummy, um, often with fluid being leaked by the cancer cells, um, and in areas such as the omentum and the peritoneum um, that um, surgeons often speak about. Uh, the problem with this is that the later the cancer is identified, the harder it is to um, to one, to treat, uh, but secondly, the harder it is um, to get rid of. Uh, and later stage cancers uh, generally uh, always relapse um, with, uh, with some exceptions, thank goodness. Um, and that's why the importance of um, early identification and early diagnosis is so key. Um, and the symptoms that they speak of are the beep symptoms, so abdominal bloating or tummy bloating, uh, feeling full but eating less, um, discomfort or a pain in the tummy, and also irritation of the bladder. Um, and these are symptoms that uh, women often uh, ignore or um, neglect or put down to another cause um, and, uh, that's, and, and often don't seek help early. So uh, one of the key aspects and one of the key um, uh, bits of information that I want you to take home is, is uh, just you know, go to your GP if you're having symptoms, um, uh, uh, especially along the lines of the, the beat symptoms. So we talk about ovarian cancer, but just to quickly go through that it is, uh, it is really felt to be cancer of the fallopian tube that has then spread into the ovary. Um, uh, and this is why the appropriate or the proper term for uh, ovarian cancer is, is, is tubo ovarian cancer, which you'll sometimes hear referred to, but in general, because uh, it's hard to teach old dogs new tricks. Uh, we still stick with ovarian cancer when we're call, calling um, when we're calling it. So ovarian cancers themselves is a real mixed bag. There's a huge variety of um, different types of cancer all under the one ovarian cancer umbrella. Um, so no one ovarian cancer is really the same as the other. Um, we split them up generally into how they look like under the microscope, so how they look like pathologically, and they, that can range anywhere from high-grade serous to more sarcomatous, to those that are more clear-celled, and those that have more mucin production or more like cancers from the colon. Um, and, and, and in general, the most common cancer is the high-grade serous um, uh, ovarian cancer. And uh, uh, however, we also, so this is the pathological look at, so they all look quite different, both when we look at the specimens, but also predominantly under the microscope, and that's what the purple images show. The, um, the different uh, microscopic findings. Uh, so the pathologists can identify that these um, cancers are very different and they behave very differently uh, in addition to looking differently. As well as that, we look at their cancer's DNA. So each ovarian cancer um, subtype has different DNA profiles or different abnormalities within its, their, their, its own DNA. Um, depending on the type that it is. And this really dictates uh, the different behaviors, the different responses to chemotherapy, and the different um, speeds at which the cancer can grow and progress. Um, so there, it's very important, but we don't routinely look for these abnormalities part, as part of routine practice at the moment, um, but that is changing, thank goodness. 
So I'm going to talk, I'll focus a little on the high grade serous cancers. Um, it's really, an, uh, this would be a, very much a, an overview, but um, looking at the high grade serous cancers um, because they are um, uh, the most common and I suppose the most research has been done on them in addition to the most clinical trials happening um, uh, in this field, uh, which, um, uh, which really flags the need for more trials in, in, in some of the less common uh, types. So when we look at the high grade serous, we can see um, predominantly abnormalities in the way the cancer is able to repair its DNA. So we develop DNA mistakes every day in every cell of our body. Um, but sometimes if something goes wrong with that process, if one of those proteins that's really important in fixing a DNA mistake goes wrong and stops doing its job, you're more likely to let these mistakes and uh, pass through the net and be undiagnosed and therefore they can then go on to develop cancer. Um, the key and the important part of this, uh, and we think that over 50% of, of, of high-grade serous ovarian cancers have these abnormalities, is when I start to discuss the PARP inhibitors, you'll see that the, um, these new drugs target this uh, weakness within the, um, the tumor's DNA, um, and that's why it's been uh, such a success. So when I spoke of that, we, we are not currently testing for these um, mutation profiles. Hopefully that will be changing, certainly in Cork in the near future. And uh, the Karen Fenton Ovarian Cancer Fund, as well as UH Charity, have really come together to, um, to um, push the purchase of one of these sequencing machines, which you uh, put in a sample of the patient's cancer in, into this machine, and it reads out a list of the mutations that it's capable of detecting. And that can really help an oncologist, but but all um, people who are involved in the care of this of, of, of this patient, in planning treatments, in uh, identifying whether there's a risk or hereditary risk to pass on these cancers, um, and and that's why it is so informative and important moving forward. So we talk about hereditary ovarian cancer, or possibly that's been able to pass on to your family or has been inherited, and the the key part is that ovarian cancer most of the time i mean over three quarters of the time is just bad luck it's just happened it's a mistake in a, a mutation that's developed that has spread and causes and is now causing a problem and um, but that only a, a minority only between you know 10 to 20 percent are actually inherited or are capable of being passed on um, and that's really important the most famous of these of course is Bra the BRCA family the BRCA1 and BRCA2 um, and they take up about three quarters of the uh, genetic mutations that we see, but there are other mutations that can go wrong and other um, um, mutations that are inherited or can be passed on that um, uh, are predisposed to ovarian cancer. So BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, the gene itself is quite long and the mutation can occur within anywhere within the gene. So some of the mutations that happen within it are not actually that important and don't affect its function. So they, they divide them up into different types uh, depending on their nastiness. And I've sort of broken them down here to being nasty, maybe nasty, a big group of unknown nastiness. So these variants of uncertain significance uh, and those mutations that are unlikely or definitely not nasty. Um, and so they're able to um, work that out. So the risk of cancer in uh, BRCA mutations um, uh, has, is outlined here in the slide. And I've used all the uh, breast, ovarian, but also the other um, male-oriented cancers. So one of the things that I see in my clinic a lot is that um, um, it's, it's often people believe that it's the females that develop the BRCA mutations and, 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 and can, are predisposed to the cancer, but it's also the men. So men can develop prostate, male breast, but also pancreatic cancer, and obviously females can get pancreatic cancer too. Um, so it's really important for all members of the family, if there is a BRCA mutation, to be tested. The BRCA mutation is unfortunately a dominant mutation, so there's a one in two chance that it can be passed on um, to children. Before and um, even continues still, there are genetic cancer risk assessments. So if we send a patient for consideration of uh, BRCA testing or other tumor type or other mutation type testing, they'll um, be assessed for their risk using these sort of personal histories uh, or family history. Um, but really, I would consider that to be should be put in the trash can that all patients with high grade 
non-mucinous ovarian cancer of any age and with any family history should be tested for the BRCA mutation. So fortunately, we have the capacity to do that now. We do that through um, a blood test, uh, which is supported by AstraZeneca, but there's also a clinical trial being run by Cancer Trials Ireland. Um, and obviously we run it through Cancer Trials Cork, which allows us to test the, the serous and the endometrioids, ind endometrioids for the, the BRCA mutation. Um, so at surgery, so the, sorry, the, the treatment of ovarian cancer is um, predominantly surgery. It's the mainstay of getting rid of all this cancer. And the surgeon needs to remove all the tumor that he can see. Um, there is consideration of, of going back in and reoperating at different at later stages in an ovarian cancer uh, pathway, but that's uh, still a little controversial. Chemotherapy is also the backbone. We've been using the same chemotherapy for you know, 20 to 30 years now, which is platinum-based, carboplatin. Um, and that's really the backbone, but we often add on all the chemotherapies on top of it. Um, however, when the cancers eventually, which they all do, become resistant to platinum, they're much harder to treat with chemotherapy at that time point. Um, and so we really need to find new treatments. We talk about a, a platinum free interval or the time between um, stopping the chemotherapy to when the cancer comes back. And this is called the platinum free interval. And the longer you have generally um, the better response at uh, the next time to the next chemotherapy. Ovarian cancer therefore becomes, especially advanced ovarian cancer over at, at you know, stage three and stage four becomes a relapsing remitting disease. Um, which a, um, goes through periods of chemotherapy and then periods of surveillance with always that fear that the cancer will come back um, until we no longer can treat with chemotherapy because the cancer becomes resistant. So one of the big things that I have um, with the treatment is when to give chemotherapy. So you have a patient who's had their chemo and they've on, they're on surveillance and when should you give chemotherapy again? And one of the best studies that uh, has really ever been run by the Medical Council in, in the UK uh, looked at patients who were started on chemotherapy uh, based on their CT scan findings or their CA125 um, compared to those that had nothing done and were just monitored. Um, and then when they developed symptoms from their cancer, then they were started on um, uh, they were started on chemotherapy and there was no difference in the patient's survival. Um, so really the summary and those are Kaplan Myers that we often put up, but this is sort of the word, this is the, 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 the word part of it where restarting chemo before the development of cancer symptoms does not improve anyone's survival and restarting chemotherapy earlier actually makes someone's quality of life much worse um, and therefore shouldn't be done. So CT scans have no role in the follow-up of, of ovarian cancer and shouldn't be done unless there's symptoms. And if there's symptoms, then absolutely, but not before. This does leave patients a little bit in limbo. Um, and there was a recent um, excellent study at ESMO presented, um, which found about 60% of patients who are in the surveillance phase um, have, have degrees of depression. And this gets better over time, um, but they spoke about a psychological intervention, a single one-off psychological intervention that really did improve this fear. Um, and recently, um, CUH with Professor Rushing Connolly at the head um, and has, uh, we've won a um, survivorship, a women's cancer survivorship grant from the ICS, uh, supported in part as well by Breakthrough Cancer Research. And we are hoping to really focus on gynecological cancers as well as breast cancers um, and look at this sort of fear, depression, anxiety uh, in the ovarian cancer survivors um, and, uh, and try and deal with that. So the treatments after chemotherapy, we often use uh, maintenance therapies, so treatments that patients stay on that don't actually kill the cancer itself, but stop it from coming back. Um, and we always used to use a Vastin. Uh, however, it really has a low impact on patients' overall survival, but might slow down the time for the cancer coming back. But there is one subgroup who would be considered high risk, who didn't have all their cancer removed at surgery, that probably do get a survival benefit from Avastin and therefore should uh, receive it. Um, but there are obviously side effects uh, in relation to it. Um, and there are some countries that don't um, give Avastin. We in Ireland give a lot of it. Um, it um, and, uh, you know, that will change as new treatments come online. 
and these are one of the main new treatments that are coming. So the PARP inhibitors, um, most commonly the Olaparib, which is the only reimbursed one for BRCA mutated ovarian cancer, but uh, Rucaparib is also available through an expanded access program at the moment. And this is why, because o, um, Olaparib, but also all of them, slows down significantly the time to cancer coming back. So if we look at SOLO2, which was the, is the first study and how when we start, we, where, which we currently have Olaparib licensed for, so it can um, quadruple the time um, to when the cancer comes back. Um, equally, SOLO1, um, they had to open the study early to present it because the patients who were on Olaparib who had BRCA mutated cancer were doing so well that even at three years, um, uh, only less than half of them had actually had a relapse um, after their original chemo. So really, um, you know, practice changing uh, treatments moving forward into the clinic. Uh, Rucaparib, Niraparib, all these drugs are hot on their heels. And the reason why I put up this horrible slide of lots of Kaplan-Myers is really to flag that it's the, the, it's not just the BRCA mutants, which is the first um, Kaplan-Meier. So it's not the, the patients who've got the BRCA mutation. They are doing well. But also, if you look at the middle slide, it's also the patients that have other mutations similar to BRCA, but not the same. And interestingly, if you look at the um, whole population in these studies, there's still a benefit to be had. So I'm accessing Rucaparib currently for all my patients um, maintenance after their second chemotherapy. Um, hormones are underused and undervalued. Um, so letrozole and anastrozole, I'm using more and more in my clinic um, with really good effects on a lot of these cancers. A lot of them express estrogen receptor um, and are quite responsive and remain very stable for long periods of time on hormones. Everyone talks to me about immunotherapy in ovarian cancer and the bottom line is it doesn't work. Um, the biggest study we have, Keynote 100, had a 10% 10, 10 response rate. So one in 10 was getting a response rate. Um, there's, um, it's been the same across the board, really, for most of the, um, the studies. So they're, they're not pursuing it. The drug companies are not going to pursue this. Uh, we're looking at combinations and also subgroups. So this is a horrible slide from the Keynote 100. It basically looks at all the different subgroups. And if you look down below, the clear cell cancers are definitely getting a, a better benefit than others, um, but also those that have a very high expression level of, of PDL1, which is a marker sometimes that we use in, in other cancers for immunotherapy response. So they're the cancers that are being tested moving forward. But really, it'll be, the, it'll be immunotherapy with combination. And we've been really lucky in Cork um, that we've just, um, um, we've just closed the Athena study. It's an international study, so it's open all the way around the world. Um, but we've got five patients onto this study, um, and they get immunotherapy with or without a PARP inhibitor or PARP inhibitor alone. Um, so we're really looking forward to the results of this study um, to prove that, uh, hopefully, um, to show that um, PARP inhibitors certainly um, to be accessed are better than nothing, but PARP inhibitors and immunotherapy may be even better again. We also have new studies coming for um, the platinum resistant uh, ovarian cancer. So those that have gone way on um, in their diagnosis and in their treatment pathways. So we've got a new study opening, the ANOVA TV 208 study, and we've also got a Soraya study with a, a folate receptor antagonist coming as well. So our Cancer Trials Cork is really busy with new trials coming for ovarian cancer. So the future is certainly bright. And just to finish um, my summary slide, just to flag ovarian cancers, are wild, widely different cancers. Surgery really still is the mainstay of treatment, but chemotherapy and other anti-cancer treatments are changing um, the face of, of how we manage ovarian cancers. We're also testing, and we will have the ability to, to assess for more mutations, more. We'll be able to sequence the cancers and know better what treatments to give. So immunotherapy won't be work on its own, but it might work in combination. And we're lucky that there's a lot of drugs in the pipeline that are being developed for ovarian cancer, which will hopefully really improve survival overall. Thank you again for uh, inviting me.